Hey, turn with me. We're going to look at the scriptures tonight, and I'm going to be in several places uh, topically, but we're going to look at heaven as home. I, I want to challenge you about something, and Randy Alcorn in his book on heaven, really, he's got about two or three chapters uh, closer to the end of the book, um, and I'm going to share a couple quotes out of his book tonight, even, but he, uh, he was talking about that most Christians treat heaven as this uh, destination, but like like you're going to go visit there, uh, like it's a trip you're, you're anxious to take. And uh, I think there's some truth to what he's saying that we, we don't think of it perhaps as home. But tonight I want to help get wet your appetite for it to be home. And I want to tell you, we'll talk about what qualities are a part of your home that make home home. So I want to talk about that tonight. And I want to take you to start with to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3 and verse 11. And it should be referenced there on your notes, I think. No, it's even on your notes. We were able to leave that one in there. Sometimes we don't have enough room to put anything but the reference. But uh, there it is. Um, he, talking about God, has set eternity in the hearts of men yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. That's the handicap I have, you have. As humans, we can't really fathom. When we talk about God from beginning to end, that's all, we, we know time. God is beyond time. Uh, heaven is eternity, it's not going to be uh, time conscious like we, we experience now. The reason that's so important for us is we need to realize that in the person that says they're an atheist, uh, says they don't believe in God, say that they're agnostic. A lot of people use that, that term today. They'll say, I'm just, I'm just kind of indifferent. I'm agnostic. Uh, God has said eternity in the hearts of men. Now, what does that really mean? What does it mean that God has put eternity in the heart of every human being, even those that will not give God acknowledgement? What does that mean? What do you think it means? I think all of us are instilled with a, a sense of a creator. Okay. All of us are in... Uh, instilled with a sense of a creator okay that's good what else comes to mind you hear that statement god has put eternity in the heart of humanity every person our nature is to worship something or someone okay and we see that in in pagan worship anywhere around the globe that there worships going on in all cultures of something right do you have something? Yeah, that men know that there is an afterlife. Okay, good. Men know that there's an afterlife. When God says he's put eternity in the hearts of men, there's multiple ways you can, you can interpret that. You really can. And you've, you guys have pointed out three of them tonight. And I, I hope you could hear, if you couldn't hear them, you probably couldn't. I tried to repeat what they said. And uh, perhaps you have one as well on line, which I have a phone somewhere. There it is. Uh, so um, you, uh, if you have a comment as well, we'll try to pull that in. But God has put eternity in the heart of every human. I think, um, I think in terms, and when I, I'm part of this is what I take from the Hebrew text as well. Um, I think of longings that there's got to be more. There's got to be something more than what I've encountered or experienced. There's got to be something beyond this life. And we see the net. We see that even in nature, we we see a, a really a call to believe in a creator. We see in all kinds of things, even in the order in the world and the order of our bodies. 
uh, to, to, that we are fearlessly and we are wonderfully and fearlessly made uh, are things that, that definitely show up. But uh, anybody else got any input on that? I, I really focus on the longing part, and it's kind of from the Hebrew text, that, that, that there is this yearning that is there in the heart of humanity. And we try to fill it with other stuff, don't we? Materialism, chasing after pleasure, status, money. There was a song written a few years ago about there's no, every man has a God-shaped hole that only he can fill. Every man has a God-shaped hole that uh, only God can fill. Thank you, sis. That, uh, that's a good word as well. Well, I want you to look at um, several scriptures tonight, and I'm going to talk about qualities of home. Uh, these are things that, as, as we talk about them, I think you'll be just reminded that these are real qualities of home. What, is, what does home mean to us? Uh, but we need to start thinking of heaven as home. The Bible calls us to that in several passages, and we'll share some of those tonight. I wanted to read a quote to you from C.S. Lewis, and he said this, um, wow, almost 100 years ago. I must keep alive in myself the desire for the true country. If you look at the language in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, they refer to this city that they were longing for or another country, a country that is different from here. Uh, he says, I must keep alive in myself the desire for the true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must never let it go, let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main objective of my life to press on to the other country and to help others to do the same. I kind of feel like that as a pastor, that I, I need to focus people on the heaven equation of life and I need to, to, to uh, do that myself and help people do the same. Donald Bloch wrote this, he said, our greatest affliction is not an anxiety, even guilt, but rather homesickness, a nostalgia, a yearning to be home with God. And I think that might be a good description of that passage in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter um, three that we read, verse 11. Uh, that may be a really close description of putting it in some other words. Again, I'll read it to you. Our greatest affliction is not anxiety or even guilt, but rather homesickness, a nostalgia or a immense yearning to be at home with God. Well, I want you to think about those that uh, perhaps early in our nation, uh, and I want to borrow from the slave culture, and some of the, the, the songs that were written that you know back in the day they were uh, black spiritual uh, songs or sometimes you would hear them called negro spirituals back in the day um, and i know we don't use that term but they you know it was used for decades that that's what they called those songs but if you listen to some of the words it's very apparent that in their circumstances of slavery and being um, captivated in you know by a slave owner and the environment and the circumstances of that they had songs that said uh, uh, I'm going going home to live with my God or uh, a chariots are coming to carry me home and there were several songs I didn't think you know some of you might not even remember some of the other ones but uh, I've, I remember hearing uh, Sweet Chariot uh, uh, coming for to carry me home. I can remember uh, even having uh, some black choirs in my home church, and they sang that song uh, along with uh, many others. 
I remember hearing a woman, I was probably about 14 years old, I wasn't even saved yet. And she sang, his eyes on the sparrow. And I thought the building was gonna explode, man. I'd never heard singing like that. It was incredible. I was 13, 14 years old. And I thought, I think I might still garden going down to this church. You know, that, that man, what singing? Uh, they just raised the roof with their praise. And you know, our choir loft held 40, 50 people. And they, there was about 11 or 12 of them uh, singing. So, I mean, it just, poof. you know, like the building was, the roof was going to explode. But man, she got on uh, the, the chorus of that song at the end. And man, they just, they, I don't know how long that song went. But man, it was awesome. It really was. So let's talk about something here. I want you to think about, and probably you already have, whether it, you've ever written it down or, or we've done it collectively like this, but I want you to think about what really makes home really home. What really makes it home? Let's pray together. And we're gonna go through several scriptures and several things that I think we could, we could all agree these are things that are things that make home home to us. So let's pray. Father, bless this night. And Lord, we, we, have, uh, we have Bob McLean on our heart and minds. Father, uh, he went to the doctor today and I know he wanted to have uh, this surgery very quickly. And Father, that, that has not worked out where that's gonna happen this Friday. It's gonna be uh, some weeks away. It'll be up in the middle of August. So we just pray for him that you'll give him an, an enduring spirit we just celebrate that, that he's going to be able to have this Parkinson's surgery on his brain. And Father, they will be able to uh, address this. Father, there's an 85% decrease in Parkinson activity, Lord, with this procedure uh, as an average. So we pray that Bob would do even, even better than that. But Lord, we pray that you bring healing to him, that he would regain control of his body. We pray that, uh, Father, you would uh, decrease his medicine in just a multiplied way. And Father, we pray that as August and then the second procedure in September, uh, as the, these days pass, Lord, you would just watch over him in the meantime. And we look forward to this being a healing process. Uh, Father, we just pray also over all that are suffering in the heat there are homeless uh, among Grand Prairie as well as the other communities of DFW and it's, it's brutal right now. We thank you there are people ministering to them and Father, we just pray that uh, we could uh, uh, do something to help uh, as well. And Father, we just pray over our AC. Lord, I just thank you for good brothers that are working on this and trying to, to give us aid in the midst of the summer here. And uh, Father, we look forward to where every air conditioning unit is replaced. In the meantime, we pray that you'd help us get by and that we can still have uh, a, a pleasant uh, atmosphere for our worship services. And we ask you to do that for us. Father, we just pray that you'll continue to bless the summer of kingdom giving. And Father, I pray that uh, you would bless these different entities in incredible ways. Lord, I have no doubt you're gonna bless the oaks in incredible ways because we did this. And I just pray that, uh, Father, you would just uh, use every gift. We thank you that we're starting to get lots of things done, the striping of the parking lot next week, uh, not this next week, but the week after to have the building painted. And for, Lord, uh, flooring uh, concepts are just about done, so we, we look forward to getting those things uh, done and where we have carpet, and where we may have uh, the other type of covering uh, for the floor. Lord, we just pray that uh, you, uh, we can get these things done. Lord, we look forward to lights being in the back parking lot. And uh, Father, we pray over Allen Harrison Company. Uh, they're gonna have men and uh, perhaps some women uh, that'll be working back here on their 15 acres. And uh, Father, all that stuff's dangerous. So we just pray for safety over them, and we pray that you would bless and keep them safe. Lord, even uh, uh, their 
pray over their superintendent, uh, the one that will be uh, managing this site. So for J Joseph Cahill, we want to we want to pray for him tonight. Lord, he may even bring his family up here from Houston to live with him. Uh, and they just stay here and plant here for a few years while this is all being built. And Lord, they've already been asking about coming to our church. So we pray that we might even be that, a church home for them. And maybe other construction workers that uh, will be here uh, during the week and uh, perhaps here on the weekends. So Father, just bless our relationship. We want to be a great neighbor, uh, Lord, to the uh, Allen Harrison Company. And uh, we ask all these things. Be our teacher now, Lord, by your, your spirit. In Christ's name, amen. Hey, let's talk about home. Home. And um, I'm going to ask you several things here um, to get you kind of thinking about this. And I'm going to go ahead and give you the fill-in because everybody always, they're like, when's he going to give us the fill-in? So let's do that first, okay? The, fi the fill-in is in heaven, familiarity is foundation, foundational. Familiarity is foundational. Well, what do I mean when I say that? And we're going to look at some scripture in a minute. But when you think of home, what are some qualities that you think of? And this can come, uh, I'll go online too, Marvin, so I can see them. It's always about 45 seconds delayed, so it, it's always a little after everybody else. But uh, I'll go on and uh, so hopefully we can see uh, them as well and just turn the sound down. So uh, what are some of those things that... Uh, I'm in the parking lot. <laughs> I got the uh, oaks, but I got the wrong one. So there, people loving the pictures of the parking lot there. Okay, I just about am with you. Yeah, and I'm hearing sound. So there we go. Okay. All right. I see Marvin's liking, loving something there. All righty. There we go. So I will be looking as well online. If you have a comment, I'll try to catch that. But what, what makes home home to you? What makes home home? Love. Family. I don't know if we can top that one, buddy. Family is awful close, though. Family. Comfort. Comfort. Open door, okay. What else? Sense of belonging. Sense of belonging? A sense of belonging, is that what you said? Okay, I, th I heard the longing. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just didn't hear the full part. I'm, it was one of those after ear things where you go, I think you said something more than that. Not longing, but longing. Yeah, I thought of that one too. In fact, I'm gonna go down here to a few, few on my list. How about relaxing? Belonging, I think is a big, big deal. How about relaxing? I'm telling you every time, every time I go somewhere, and we've gone a lot of places this year already, uh, had a couple of weddings. My brother's in Miami. We did that down on South Beach. Beautiful, beautiful place right on the ocean there um, at a resort. And uh, we did um, several uh, other trips. We went to Denver to do uh, Georgina and Josh's wedding. Uh, we were in Chicago two weeks ago to give the, do the presentation um, for Tequila and and uh, and Garrett for Access Church, and they are now just about six weeks from starting. So, I want you to pray for them. Um, 
So we were in Chicago. Um, went back home for my mom's funeral. You, you know my, you, you, you can tell this. <laughs> Rick's doing a better job than I am. He's got a better memory than I do. All right. Uh, but we've been, we've been several places, you know, little short trips, but uh, we've, we've done several. And I, I can almost guarantee you that that first night that, that I'm somewhere else, I mean, if it's a nice hotel, it doesn't matter. If it's at a friend's house or a family member's house, that first night, I can almost guarantee you I'm not in my bed and I am not going to sleep well that first night. Second night might be a different story. I might do settle in a little bit. But there's something about being somewhere else and sleeping in a bed that's not yours. And we will make the statement, I can't wait to get home and sleep in my bed. My bed, my bed right? Yeah. You know, I keep seeing this commercial about relaxing them sleep and uh, how much it's helped Governor Huckabee. Uh, I'm like, maybe I, maybe I need to make a phone call or need to, to uh, go online. Um, some of those ads, you just see them so many times, I just feel like I need to get that stuff for fruit and vegetables now, you know? Uh, just because you see it, you see it, you see it, I'm like, maybe, maybe, maybe I'd feel a little better if I had, had those fruit and vegetable uh, uh, pills. Now you know what station I watch, right? All right. So anyway, I just share that. Uh, but we we do have that that issue where uh, we can be away. It's not your bed. It's just different. Uh, how about the idea and concept we're talking about? For those of you who came in a little late, uh, we we're talking about what makes home home to us. Uh, I would say hosting others. I would also say that which is familiar to us to get back to the point of what we were talking about. And it looks like some others are making comments. There goes the glasses, yeah. And we've got home is love. Marvin says home is love. He, Marvin is watching. How about that? I am so proud of you, Marvin, for watching. Amen, brother. Home is love. It's security. It's peace. Man, he's got a bunch. He's got, man, he's, got, he's got some good ones here. Home is love, which you, you said the same. Security. Isn't that a big part of home is you feel secure there? That when somebody has like a, a home break in, this is often disrupted. If somebody has had their house robbed or there's been something, uh, you know, been a break in of some t type. Did you have another one? Dogs. dogs? All dogs go to heaven, right? <laughs> well, I've wondered about a few I've had. Uh, just, just saying. Uh, family members, safe place to enjoy the fellowship with uh, your spouse, your wife. Those are excellent, Marvin. Good job. What'd you say? Children running. Everywhere. So that's home to you, Joe. Children running everywhere. Uh, I kind of agree with that right now. I didn't six months ago, but I do now. So uh, I'm with you on that, brother. Children running everywhere. I, I, you ought to see the greeting I get every time I come home. It's incredible. It starts with the dog. The dog gets to me first. Little, little teddy bear, our little, our little toy poodle. And I have to go to the bed to double rub his belly. He rolls over and he's praising the Lord or something. I don't know. But he, I have to double rub his belly and I do that. And then one after the other kids is wrapping those little little arms around your legs and your waist and hugging you and kissing you and peppy peppy's home peppy's home so joe what do they call you when you come home sir what do they call you when you come home what do they call me yeah 
Paul Paul Joe? Grandpa. Grandpa. Grandpa Joe. Okay. It's so cool to be a grandparent, isn't it? Because you get to name yourself, right? No. No? Some of us, right? I didn't name myself. My daughter Jordan gave me the name Peppy when I, she was in, in uh, high school. And so now she doesn't want to use it because the grandchildren use it. So she, she calls me Papa and she calls me all kinds of names. I, some of them I'm even, I'm like, is that, is that a good name? I don't know, you know? So she doesn't want to use Peppy anymore since the grandkids have taken it from her. But uh, those are all concepts and I, I think we need to go back to that. You know, when we moved here, we, we tried to buy a house right away and it just, housing market was crazy. Uh, you know, you, you, had, you had to get in the first day or you didn't even have a shot at it. And uh, we bid on a place right here in Westchester and uh, we were trying to downsize at that point. It just had about 2,000 square feet or maybe 22. Well, we were moving from a home that had about 3,700 square feet in Ohio. And, uh, and we kept saying we're going to downsize. Well, then we agreed, well, we missed out on that bid. We didn't get it. And then uh, we kept looking and looking, and we were like, okay, we'll, we'll get something 25 to 2,700 square feet. <clears throat> and then Mama kept talking. That's all I'm going to say. And she said, yeah, I'm all for the downsizing. We, we need to do that. Yes, yes. But, you know, we got four children and we've got grandchildren. And they will come home. And they will visit. And sometimes they come live with you, right? So, amen. anyway. <laughs> amen. <laughs> so, anyway, Kimma goes, I, I want to have enough space that all the children can be here. I'm like, honey, that kind of shoots us in the foot on downsizing. So, because I'm large and in charge in my family, we bought another four room bedroom house with three full baths. And uh, we, we big on the corner lot. That's a big thing with me. So I can get lots of parking because we like to host. I've started seven life groups out of my house. And haven't started one here because we've been doing the one over at the apartments. And, uh, but I'll probably start another one uh, in the near future. And it's definitely getting in better atmosphere for that. So we got four bedrooms and three bathrooms, full bathrooms. And uh, now Keela's gone. But then Brittany and our grandbabies show up. So we, uh, it's, it's filled up again. In fact, my mom's asked me when she can come stay. I said, we got to figure out where we can put you. There's not a bed. So we're going to have to figure out that part. Uh, but anyway, uh, man, just several things God was just in. Who knew COVID was going to hit? Who knew that an office area would be, be very important? And it sure has for me and Kemma both. Kemma still is home. Uh, couple of days a week. She's going in three days a week now, but still. Uh, so lots of things. Uh, there was, you know, just different things that, uh, but I can, I can tell you that first year that we rented that other house, I never felt like I was coming home because I knew it wasn't going to be my home. We signed a year lease. I knew that sometime in that year, we were going to, we we're probably going to buy something. So in month eight, September, we found the house. Kim and I had it on, uh, it was second on her list. It was first on mine. And we bought that house. Really believing the Lord was in it. Little did we know all how we would need that space very shortly. So anyway, God was really in that. But at, at my home, there are all kinds of things, whether it's the aroma of my coffee brand or whether it's breakfast or little voices now in our house that we dearly love and treasure and just really are thankful for this time with them, that we can invest in them even more than just occasional visits. So um, 
Kim is there. I mean, if you saw the greeting I got from my dog, it's, it's shameful. I mean, you, you'd think Jesus walked in or something, you know. It's, it's just crazy how he, he just goes, and it's me and Kimma. He just treats us, treats us in a wonderful way. So anyway, well, I'm just kidding about Jesus, guys. You know that. So, uh, but I mean, just that, he, that he's that thrilled and just loves on us, you know. And the, the kids, uh, different things make things home, don't they? Uh, I want you to look a little deeper at this and look at some scriptures with me. In heaven, family is found there. Write that down. Family is found there. And when you get to the scriptures, you'll look at Hebrews chapter 11. And I want to read this passage to you. And I want you to hear how these that were walking by faith or through faith. You'll find those expressions all throughout the roll call of the faithful in Hebrews 11. It starts in verse 13 with these words. It says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, just like you're doing now. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of a country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they're looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. Those people that lived in the Old Testament, their names are recorded for us because they walked by faith or through faith all the days of their life till the day they died. That scripture's emphatic about until they died. Their whole life they were faithful in looking uh, for the Lord in just this way. So I wanted to share with you uh, from this passage several things that I think we can draw about family life or home life um, because you can be single and home is still home, isn't it? Uh, just if you're living there, if you're widowed or you're a widower uh, and you're living you know, in your home uh, on your own, think about how this passage talks about our Christian and uh, he Hebrew uh, ancestors and eventually our Christian ancestors. And uh, I can remember a few years ago, it's when we still had uh, Jordan and Luke and Keila at home in Ohio. And uh, they were all living and we Man, we, we hadn't taken a vacation for a couple of years. We had been busy with the building of the new church building. And, you know, that, that was a mammoth project. That was a, a $10.8 million project on a piece of land that was another $2 million. So it's, it was a huge project on 75 acres of land, um, 73,000 foot square foot building. Um, so anyway, we, we, we finally got away. Well, we went to one of our old stomping grounds back when we were kids. We went to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Well, if you've ever been to Myrtle Beach, and uh, probably most of you have not, but uh, if you've ever been on the East Coast and went to Myrtle Beach, it's, it's a pretty uh, commercialized, developed beach area. It's, it's, uh, it's got a strip, I think it's called the the something mile and man I mean you talk about restaurants and you know little places to play games and do things as a family it's just activity central and they had a Ripley's believe it or not just like we have one over on the other side of Grand Prairie uh, they also had an aquarium well for whatever reason maybe because we're at the ocean our kids wanted to go to the aquarium well, about every city in the country now, 
our, our kids had a really nice one down at Corpus Christi. There's a really nice aquarium down there right, right beside the, uh, uh, the big naval aircraft carrier there. And uh, we've been there. But we went in there and I kept thinking about all these fish in all these tanks. Not one fish was meant to be in those tanks. They were meant for something much grander. The ocean, the sea itself. And I mean, every fish we looked at and we just kept looking and there was places you could walk and they were on top of you and sharks and other huge fish. And you know, it's fascinating to look at but whether you have a five gallon aquarium at your, your house, a little tank for fish, and that's a thing. And man, when we lived in Florida, everybody had fish tanks. It was like the thing. If you lived there, you better have a fish tank and have some fish. And there was some certain kind of fish you should have. Those fish don't belong there. They were designed for something much grander. So were you. This earth is not your home, you just passing through. Amen. You really are. You were designed for eternity somewhere else, not here. Not in this fallen world with all of the things that we think are so beautiful, but you were designed for something much grander. And I, every time I go to a fish aquarium now, which I, you know, you got grandkids, you're going, right? You're going to go look at the fish someplace or look at something like this or the zoo. We've been to uh, the Fort Worth Zoo and the Dallas Zoo already. And I have no doubt we'll be going back and uh, looking some more, you know. And uh, because some of the, uh, the kids already reminded me there was things at the Fort Worth Zoo and things at the Dallas Zoo that they were they were not open. And if they're not open, you have to go back to see them because we only saw some of the monkeys. We didn't see the new line cage over at Fort Worth. They had that closed. Uh, different things. So be going back. But every time I go to a zoo or an aquarium, this, I don't know if you, your mind operates this way, your pastors does. I think about how they're contained in an area that they don't belong. And I always want to go, freedom, run, get away, go away. You know, I mean, I know they're there to entertain us and educate us and all the rest, even going to SeaWorld or any of these places. And of course, they've been doing some changes with theirs. But uh, anyway, I always think about how they don't belong here. They belong out there in, in nature, doing their thing, you know. Uh, you, you don't belong here. Amen. Did you know that? I mean, we're here now for the time God has allotted for our lifespan. That's it. And for most of us, it's going to be 70, 80 years. We got this new category of all these 100,000 He's uh, way 150,000 adults living over 100 now in the United States. So we're living longer. You may live longer. I don't know that I want to. I would, I, I mean, I, I want all the life here I, God will give me, but I, I'm anxious to get home. To get home, really home. Because we're designed for the same, aren't we? Look at this third principle, and that is heaven is a place of comfort. Now, I'm, I'm trying to remember who said comfort. I think it might have been you, Rick. Heaven is a, a, a place of comfort. Is home a place of comfort? Yeah. You got a certain chair you sit in? Amen. I guarantee you, we dudes, we got a chair. I mean, it's like a man thing, isn't it? But there's a chair. Now, at my, at my mom's house, she's got a chair. And you don't sit in that chair. That's her chair. And it's a, it's a lazy boy kind of chair, too. I, I think it looks like it might be comfortable. But I hadn't gotten in it because I ain't messing with Mama. That's her chair. You know, that's where she's going. If we go in that room, she's sitting in there. All right? Uh, 
There's just things that we're used to like that. I remember after my dad died and we started to have a dinner after the funeral and we all stood there and it had not dawned on us who's going to sit in that chair. And my mom said, Barry, you're the, old, you're the eldest son. Take your place. That's for you now. And I said, Mom, you're the matriarch of our family. I think that belongs to you. And she sat down in that chair and we all cried like babies. I mean, it's just unreal how that stuff hits you. You don't, you don't even think about it until that moment comes, huh? And, uh, but I got, I got a chair. I got a chair upstairs in the theater room. It's my chair. I'll share it with the grandbabies and with the dog. And if Kimma wants part of it, she can have it, right? And then I got another chair in my bedroom. And it's another small little recliner. And that's, that's one of my spots. Something about home is comforting to us, isn't it? Whether it's a chair, it smells, it sounds, it's your backyard, outside. There are things that just make you feel at home, don't they? So heaven is a place of comfort. I want you to hear what John Newton said. This is funny. <laughs> he said, when I get to heaven, I shall see three wonders there. The first is I will see many people in whom I did not expect to see. Second, the second wonder is that I will miss many people that I was expecting to see. They're not there. And last of all, and most important, and greatest for me, is I will be there. And that may have surprised me the most. <laughs> so, anyway, that was a great, I just thought, I, I gotta share that one, that's awesome. Look at that great passage found in the book of Second, uh, or First Thessalonians chapter 4. And read with me verse uh, uh, 13, down here to the end of that chapter. It says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep within him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. And then listen to verse 18. Here's the instruction. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. I'm sorry, that's verse 16. With a loud command and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are alive and are left will be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will we be forever with the Lord. Therefore, uh, encourage each other with these words. You know, that's a home going, isn't it? That's the homecoming of all home homecomings. We're going home to be with the Lord. Some had already died. They'll be resurrected. Those that are still alive will be raptured up to meet the Lord in the air. And we will forever be with the Lord. And he ends this passage and says, comfort each other. There's a reason at almost every graveside service I ever do. I read this passage. Why? Because I want them to know that their prayers and whatever had, had happened to their, their brother or sister, their loved one, all that's going to give way to Jesus and he's going to resurrect that body and bring them, this body will be resurrected to life again. And it'll be perfect. And I always feel like I have a spiritual pastoral obligation to read this passage, to remind them that what you watched take your loved one now will surrender to Jesus Christ someday and they will literally come up out of this ground. They'll get to go before we do, and then we'll join them. I think it's really important for us to remember that heaven is a refuge. I mean, heaven is, is, a, is going to be a refuge for us. Think of the things that are not going to be there. We're told 
that we won't have to worry with the night anymore. Jesus is the light that lights heaven. Tells us that there'll be no pain, no sorrow, no struggles, no tears. Every tear will be what? Wiped away from your eyes. So we have these promises from God. Heaven is going to be a place of tremendous comfort. And then I want you to look at this fifth principle, or I'm sorry, number four. Heaven is where friends will fellowship. And I want to show you several passages, and there's several fill-ins here. Write in the word fellowship on number four. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, one of the things that we're told about heaven, and, you know, I, I love doing weddings. It's just a thing. I love seeing people start their life together. I love counseling them. Uh, I love helping them get the best possible start we can. And then you go to this wedding. You know, there's so many things as a pastor I deal with that are sad. Somebody dies. Even though we rejoicing in them being in heaven, there's still great sorrow. Somebody's sick. Somebody's going through difficult times. Marriages break up. On and on the list goes of negative things I have to deal with as a pastor. So I love, I love weddings. And I'll tell you something about these, these new weddings, not so much in the old days, but you're going to get some good food. There's going to be some good eats going on at these weddings these days. It's just, it's just the way it is. Uh, people spend a lot of money on these weddings. Uh, I always try to tell them, what really counts is the marriage. The wedding's just a kickoff day. It ought to be celebrative, but you shouldn't go bankrupt because uh, it costs so much. Listen to this passage in Matthew 8, 11. It says, I say to you, Jesus talking, that many will come from the east and from the west and will take their place at the feast. And we don't talk about this feast very often. The feast with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Does that sound kind of like an Old Testament party? There might be some good Israeli food at that thing. You think? Might be some fresh figs. Just some great food. Things that maybe you, you haven't sampled in this life. Maybe you have. So put in the blank there, feasting. All right? Feasting. Anybody like to go to a great dinner? I do. I think you can tell by looking at me, I like, I like to go to a nice feast. I do. Uh, one of the things I love about weddings is you, you, you're going to have some great food. My brother pulled, pulled it out like you wouldn't believe down in uh, at South Beach. Uh, I had a wonderful big giant steak that night. And I'm a steak kind of guy. I like, that. I like those steaks. The Bible says that in the kingdom of God, and see, we, most people don't talk about this kind of feasting, but, but there it is. So look at this next verse in Isaiah 25, 6. On the mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast, rich food for all people, a banquet of aged wine, with the best of meats and the finest of wines, Isaiah 25, 6. Anybody talked about that, that feast? We just talked about two feasts that nobody ever talks about in the kingdom of God, but they're right there in scripture, right? Look at the next one. And this one is a great passage. I don't know about you, but one of the things I love about family and getting home is... Uh, we laugh. We laugh with each other. We, we don't laugh at each other. We laugh with each other. Right? Sometimes. <laughs> Tell it like it is, brother. That's right. Listen to this. The Bible tells us, Blessed are you who, who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Where are you going to be satisfied? You'll be satisfied walking with the Lord in this lifetime, but where will you really be satisfied? You're going to be satisfied in the kingdom of heaven. That's right. 
for you will what? Laugh. Do you enjoy laughter? You should, it's a gift. A gift, laughter. Sometimes I get so tickled and usually Kimma is the trigger. Now you think Kimma's kind of on the quiet side. You get her laughing and she can't stop. And it's one of those people that's contagious. You know what I'm talking about. Everybody's laughing. In fact, you can't stop laughing. In fact, there's been times I'm laughing till tears are running down my face. You know, we have a staff like that, don't we Tiff? We laugh together. Occasionally we laugh till we cry. Don't we, Gary? <laughs> Gary, you're not so sure, okay. I've seen you laugh, brother. But we, we enjoy each other. I wanna give you one last scripture here, and that's this. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 19, verse 14, let the little children come to me, and I want you to apply this in a little different way. And do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Write down the word childlikeness. We gotta be like kids to enter the kingdom of heaven. Will that be a quality that we can enjoy again in the kingdom of God? Is that what that means at that second part of the verse or does it mean something else? For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. But childlikeness is a beautiful quality. They're taught something and they believe it, don't they? Because usually mom and dad or a grandparent taught them that. I just end with this. <clears throat> Imagine someone invites you to a party. This is right out of the book of Randy Al 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 Alcorn, Alcorn uh, in his book on heaven. He's got a great chapter on heaven is home. He's got about three chapters towards the end of the book. Check them out. I'm borrowing this from one of his stories that he told. Imagine someone invites you to a party. You're enjoying seeing a few friends there, a couple of good conversations and some decent appetizers. The party's all right. You're hoping it'll get better but you're enjoying yourself. Suddenly the friend that brought you turns to you and says, I gotta go. I've gotta take you home first. You initially are bummed out, aren't you? You're enjoying yourself. It's not the best party you ever went to, but it's a party. You're eating good food. You're having, a, you're, you're having some good conversations. However, you're disappointed. Nobody wants to leave a party early, but you leave because the other person's driving. And you reach home, you reach your driveway, you walk into your house, you reach for the lights, and lo and behold, when the lights come on, you hear, surprise! It's a party for you. Now you're at your party. You got lots of familiar faces there, and family, and friends. You've got loved ones. There's the aroma of some of your favorite foods and beverages. You can smell them in the air. People are hugging you, saying wonderful things and telling you, I love you, I love you. Happy birthday, I love you, I love you. Have you ever realized that if you didn't, if he didn't leave that other party, he'd never gotten to his own party? And you think about people with terminal illnesses. You think about people that their lives have been cut short by our standards. But we need to get a perspective that they've gone to the ultimate party that they'll ever experience, the kingdom of heaven, if they're his children. And that's exactly what heaven is like, isn't it? That no matter what we think we're injustices in this lifetime with lifespan, with disease, with sickness. Man, you're going to the party of parties in the kingdom of God. And I'll tell you something, the kingdom of God is a massive party. It is. Don't ever forget that. Luke 6, 22, I end with, blessed are you when men hate you for the cause of Christ. 
when they exclude you and insult you. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. The biggest party that exists. You haven't been to yet. It's coming to a life near you. In fact, it's coming to your life. 